Well, hey guys, I hope your week is going well. In today's video, I'm gonna talk about treatments for seborrheic keratoses. Seborrheic keratoses are really common skin lesions. They are brown or tan, sometimes lightly skin colored. They can be thin and flat or raised and almost like a warty growth and they will occur anywhere on the skin, face, around the eyes, the back, you name it, they occur pretty much anywhere. They're so common, it's estimated that over 83 million Americans have seborrheic keratoses. They're one of the most common benign skin lesions, meaning they are not precancerous, there's no risk of them turning into a skin cancer, so there's no need to treat them. However, they can be cosmetically bothersome, impact the way you feel about yourself, and so you may be wondering, well, what can be done to get rid of them? Seborrheic keratoses can be treated by your dermatologist in the office using a variety of procedures. The first procedure that can be done is something called cryotherapy, which involves liquid nitrogen freezing spray. This works by uh, destroying the skin cells that comprise the seborrheic keratoses through the formation of ice crystals within the skin cells that constitute the seborrheic keratosis lesion. If you've ever had cryotherapy or a liquid nitrogen freezing spray to anything on your skin, you know it's very uncomfortable, it stings, it burns, it can be painful. A risk with having a seborrheic keratosis treated with cryotherapy is that it can leave behind uh, a scar. It can also leave behind what's called post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So it is not the number one choice and it's something that is reserved only for areas of the skin where maybe you're not gonna, it's not gonna be as noticeable. It works a little bit better for thinner lesions than thicker ones. And it's something that we don't tend to do in people of darker skin type because of the risk of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that can be more likely in those skin types. Second treatment modality that is more often used is something called electrocautery or electrodesiccation. It involves an electrocautery tool, which I'm sure you've seen in your dermatologist's office. And the way this works is by um, uh, delivering an electrical current to the skin lesion that essentially destroys the skin cells. And I like this method. It's fast, it's easy, and it has less of a risk in comparison to cryotherapy of post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation and scarring. However, it does require that the skin lesion um, have a little bit of numbing medication go into it. Otherwise, it's very uncomfortable. So it can be a little bit more time intensive than just the cryotherapy. Uh, but it's useful for small lesions, and the downside I would say is there still is a risk of hyperpigmentation and scarring, but less so than with cryotherapy. The next two treatment options are um, curatage and shave excision. These basically will remove the skin lesion, the seborrheic keratosis. Curatage is this little um, tool that we use that's basically a loop that is kind of like a blade and it can be used to scoop up things and pick them off of the surface of the skin for lack of a better descriptor. So that's something that can be used. It's useful for solitary lesions, but there is a risk of a scar behind and when you use a curette or a curatage, you are creating a wound in the skin. So there is some post-procedure care that needs to, to go on afterwards. You have to take care of the site. Just like if you had a cut, uh, you have to keep it covered with a Band-Aid. So, you know, it requires a little bit more um, on your part. The downside of cryotherapy is the risk of scarring and hyperpigmentation is even greater than with cryotherapy. So it's something that I almost never do for um, seborrheic keratoses, particularly in cosmetically sensitive areas uh, because of the risk of scarring. Shave excision, however, is a little less risky in terms of scarring than uh, curatage. Shave excision means we numb up the skin lesion and shave it off flat and uh, there's not a as much of a risk of scarring, it's more precise, and so there's less risk of scarring. But that's pretty time intensive as well. Sometimes seborrheic keratoses are really um, small and what's called pedunculated, meaning they're kind of on a stalk, in which case another sort of type of shave removal, although not quite a shave, is that we can put a little bit of numbing medicine right under the skin at the base of the stalk and then use some sharp scissors 
uh, sharp scissor instruments to snip the base and that also will remove the seborrheic keratosis. So it's a little bit faster than the shave excision, but is another option. Laser therapy is something that also can be considered and it's particularly useful in the situation where say you have a ton of seborrheic keratosis like on your back, for example, it's going to be more expensive and in case I didn't say this at the beginning of the video, most of these treatments, if, if not all of them, are not going to be covered by insurance. In fact, none of them are going to be covered by insurance. So you're gonna have to pay out of pocket for it. So this is gonna be more costly, but it might be a more a better option to kind of hit everything all at once. Um, and again, it's useful for large surface areas. There are two types of lasers that um, have been examined in studies, a 755 nanometer Alexandrite laser and a 532 nanometer diode laser, both of which have been shown to, to result in good outcomes and clearance of the seborrheic keratosis. The risks are pain and discomfort, and you can also have some discoloration of the skin. That's less of a risk with some lasers than others, ablative lasers, are more risky for scarring. So Escada is a newer treatment that has been FDA approved for treatment of seborrheic keratoses. Again, it's not covered by insurance. Escada is interesting. It's 40% hydrogen peroxide. We don't know how it works to treat seborrheic keratoses, but it seems to be effective and is now, now a new treatment option that we have. It um, carries less of a risk of hyperpigmentation than some of the more traditional treatments do in that it is less cytotoxic to the skin cells that make pigment, the melanocytes. Uh, but again, we don't really know how it works. 40% hydrogen peroxide is a super omega dose. And so uh, your skin is a barrier and kind of keeps it out. Uh, but at that, at that level, some can get into the, into the skin of the seborrheic keratosis and destroy it. Uh, this is something that has to be done in the office. You can't do this yourself, nor should you attempt it. It can be very dangerous. Um, and basically what happens is uh, your dermatologist can apply this medication onto the seborrheic keratosis. Um, and you know, in an office visit, you can, get a, you can get treatment of generally, you know, maybe 10 lesions all at once is, is kind of reasonable what you might expect in the course of an office visit. So the medication will be applied in a circular motion and you know, treating multiple ones, you, you, you treat each one individually. And then uh, it is then repeated three more times within that visit. So there are a total of three applications. You then need to come back to the office in a week and sometimes another round of treatment is needed. Other times they're completely gone. So it seems to be um, really promising and, is, and is, seems to be a better option based on the clinical studies, although it is still a pretty new, new medication um, in, in our armamentarium, but it seems really promising for treating these with less risk of hyperpigmentation and discomfort and yielding good clearance of the seborrheic keratoses. There's a very low risk of scarring and pigmentary changes with Escada in comparison to traditional approaches for treating seborrheic keratoses. In the studies, it was less than 1%. Uh, the downsides are it's uncomfortable, there's some burning, there's some stinging, and there's some sensation of irritation. So your skin is a barrier to the peroxide, and in, with Escada, you're having a very, very high dose applied to the skin lesion, so a little bit will get into the skin lesion. However, if the seborrheic keratosis is inflamed or irritated, which can often occur like in areas of friction, uh, like under your armpits, for example, uh, and the skin barrier of the seborrheic keratosis is impaired, then it uh, is not a good idea to have the treatment on that because you will get you'll get a very high, you know, more uptake and it can be dangerous. So it's only put on skin lesions, seborrheic keratoses that are not, that are not inflamed or irritated or have, you know, in which the skin barrier is impaired. What's compelling about Escada though, is that it's really the first topical that has been shown to be effective as a treatment option for, for seborrheic keratoses. Other topical treatment methods that we've looked at um, really don't yield very substantial results as far as clearance and removal of the seborrheic keratosis. Um, for example, retinoids. I have several videos talking about retinoids, vitamin A derivatives. If you've watched any of those videos, you know that those ingredients uh, can, 
help to normalize skin cells and uh, exfoliate the skin. Do they work? Not well. The um, Specifically, Tazeratine or Tazerac has been examined. Um, and twice daily application of Tazerac in one clinical study resulted in clearance in 7 out of 15 patients as compared to cryotherapy, which yielded 15 out of 15. Um, and so, you know, it may not be something that is cost effective to treat these, but it is something that has been examined and shown to be somewhat effective, but the studies are really small, so it's not going to be a go-to treatment. Imiquimod or Aldera is a cream that we use to treat warts. Seborrheic keratoses kind of look like warts, um, so it's been it's been tried on seborrheic keratoses, and it doesn't really seem to result in much clinical improvement. What about stuff that you can get over the counter? 12% ammonium lactate, which is what you will find in um, amlactin or uh, lachydrin, is a keratolytic ingredient. It's an exfoliating ingredient. Uh, found in moisturizers targeting dry skin. It just kind of softens softens uh, dry, built-up skin. And when that was applied two, two times a day for 16 weeks, uh, it resulted in actual de actually decreased height of the seborrheic keratosis. So if you have one that's kind of uh, heaped up and mount you know large, uh, it can decrease the height, make it thinner, but it doesn't seem to affect the um, overall size of the seborrheic keratosis and it really doesn't seem to be effective at all at getting rid of them. I think maybe one of them spontaneously cleared with using the lac hydrant in the study. Uh, so, you know, it's not a harmful thing to do and it's, you know, over the counter. And it, at the end of the day, those are great moisturizers uh, for keeping the skin hydrated. So, you know, kind of no harm, no foul and, and, and pretty cheap. But uh, seems like, you know, maybe it can thin it out a little bit. So you can see there are a variety of treatment options available. The right choice is going to depend on a few factors. Uh, the size of the seborrheic keratosis, how thick it is, the location, your background skin type, how many there are. Uh, most people have at least nine, if not 30 or more. And some people have hundreds of them. And so it's gonna depend on a variety of things. Also cost, obviously, these are not going to be covered by insurance and convenience to you, the patient, and uh, you know, in terms of guiding what's going to be the best choice for you. Escada is new and promising and exciting. We now have something that we can apply topically to the skin that has a very low risk, it appears, of hyperpigmentation, hypopigmentation, or scarring, uh, but it's still new, so limited clinical experience with it, but uh, promising. And, you know, unfortunately, obviously not gonna be covered by insurance, but I hope this video was helpful to you guys in kind of addressing the treatment options for seborrheic keratoses. They are so common. Uh, and, you know, they can really, they can really bother our patients a lot from a cosmetic perspective. And, you know, sometimes they're in areas like under the breast, under the armpit, that, um, you know, are under a lot of friction and they can become irritated, inflamed and become uncomfortable and you wanna get rid of them. So it's, you know, something that, that people are, are always wanting to, to uh, have the dermatologist take a look at and take care of. So I hope this video was helpful to you guys. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends and as always, don't forget, sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys tomorrow, bye.